Hello again, everyone, and welcome to a short stop with a short stop. I am so daggone excited tonight, I can't hardly stand it. We got the Giants and the Dodgers in Game 5, winner take all. Get ready to play the Atlanta Braves for the National League pennant. So at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I need everybody that is a Giants fan to get on the TV and watch it and root them on home. The Giants can beat the Dodgers, baby. Go Giants! All right. Today, we want to look at the markings of the New Testament church. This is a very important subject because let's look at the San Francisco Giants. Do they have markings that we can know who they are? Absolutely we do. We know that they have an orange SF on their black hat, which stands for San Francisco. On their uniforms, uh, it either has Giants on it or it has San Francisco. That's a marking that they have. We know that their home stadium is Oracle Park. Uh, we know that their hometown that they play in is San Francisco. That's some markings of the San Francisco Giants who we would know exactly who they are. Now, if they were called the San Francisco Giants and they were playing in Baltimore or New York or, or something like that, saying that that was their home state, you would know that somebody was not telling you the truth because the markings just would not match up. But now, at the New Testament church, First off, who is head of the church? I think we all know that that's Jesus Christ. Uh, we look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, and it reads as follows. It's, it says, For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Now, the body and the church are interchangeable words, but Christ is head of the church. And if we turn back to Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verses 22 and 23, it reads as follows. And he put all things in subject, subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, talking about Jesus, he is the head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. Jesus Christ is head of the body, the church. Now, if you're going to a church and Jesus Christ is not head of that church, I would advise you to get out of it because that's marking number one. Number two, how many churches are there? And if we go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and, and, and read verse 4, it talks about seven ones here. And in verse 4 it says, there is one body. Now, we, we've already established that the body and the church are the same. And if the Bible tells us that there is one body, then we need to believe that because it goes on and tells us that there's one God. How many gods do we say that there are? There's only one. And then if we turn to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus Christ Himself said, I will build my church. Now, did He say that in a singular sense or did He say that in a plural sense? He said it in a singular sense. And we know that in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, that that was where the church started. I've had the privilege of going to Greece, and I went to Corinth, uh, I went to uh, Athens, uh, I went to uh, Thessalonica, and Paul went to a lot of these congregations himself and made sure that they were all teaching the same thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree 
Now listen to this. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. Now the things that were being taught in Corinth were the same things that were being taught in Jerusalem. The things that were being taught in Jerusalem and Corinth were the same things that were being taught in Athens at the congregation there. The things that were taught in Athens were also being taught in Thessalonica. And you had the same church. There was not any divisions among them. They had some problems, and Paul would go back on occasions and, and correct those problems that they had. But he wanted to make sure that they were following the instructions that God and Jesus had laid out. What about the organization of the church? Uh, in in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7, through 7, it gives qualifications for elders. Now, the elders would be older men, would be well-read men, would be men that were apt to teach, would be the husband of one wife, uh, would be able to uh, conduct themselves out in the public in a, a way that God would want them to. But he also could control his own home. And that means his children. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says they were supposed to feed the flock. That means to make sure that they got spiritually fed with, with God's Word. And in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, it says they are to be on watch for their brethren's soul because they're going to be held accountable for it. But also in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, you have deacons. And deacons are servants. And if you look at Acts chapter uh, 6 and verses 1 through 6, uh, you have a, a group of men that started serving. And, and I think that was the first deacons that were ever there. And they, they were in a serving capacity. They didn't make the decisions for the church. The elders did that. But for a congregation to be organized correctly, there has to be elders and deacons. Now, I want to say this. There cannot be deacons without elders because there has to be an eldership already established for the deacons to work under. Now, if you're in a congregation that only has deacons and doesn't have elders, I would think that you need to reconsider where you're at. Now, what about worship? Worship would definitely be a, a marking of the New Testament church. Uh, we talk about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28, or Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus instituted himself, or Luke chapter 22. And it says that in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, that they came together to break bread when? On the first day of the week. You don't break bread on Friday. You don't break bread on Saturday. But the first day of the week is Sunday. That would be one of the markings of the church, how they worshiped. Also, they sang. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Uh, and it was part of a congregational thing. It wasn't a solo. It wasn't a band. It wasn't a, a, a quartet. But it was congregational singing. That would be another marking of the New Testament church. Praying in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. They prayed for one another. Uh, they prayed for other churches. Uh, they prayed for the preacher. They prayed for the elders. Uh, also teaching, also in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they would be taught the Word of God, and that would be part of worship, and it would also be done on each and every single first day of the week. And then you have giving. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, it says, on each and every first day of the week, lay by in stores you have been prospered. Now, do they do that on Saturday or Friday? No, it says they do it on the first day of the week, but we should prepare to ourselves to be able to give on each and every first day of the week. And then in John chapter 4 and verse 24, it says we're supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth. In spirit is having the right attitude, and truth is doing it by the Word of God. Those are the five acts of worship that are the markings of a New Testament church. If the church that you are going to is not doing those five things and doing them correctly, I would suggest that you rethink where you're going. Now, what about church attendance? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 tells us not to forsake the assembly. Now, this comes back to the elders. The elders say what time that you meet on Sunday. Now, you may meet at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you may meet at 10 o'clock in the morning. You may come back on Sunday night. You may meet on Wednesday night. But the elders 
of a congregation are the ones that decide what time that the congregation meets. And to say that, I, let me say this. Each and every congregation of the Lord's church is autonomous. And I hope you can see the Lord's wisdom through that because there could be a congregation here in Paintsville that's doing exactly what they're supposed to do. But there might be a congregation 20 miles from here that has gone off of God's word and their eldership is may be letting women preach or something of that nature and, and, and are doing things that are not doctrinally sound. But those congregations that were 20 miles away could not be able to tell the congregation in Paintsville to let women preach because they are solely ruled by the elders of that congregation. And so if one congregation may go off doctrinally, but that doesn't mean that the other one will. But that's where God's wisdom comes in. I'm going to show a chart here. <clears throat> I think we have a picture of it, but I want you all to look at this chart very closely and even take a picture of it yourself and try to look at each and every single scripture that is on there and, and try to get a better understanding of how God tells us that we obey the gospel plan of salvation. And when one obeys the gospel plan of salvation properly, he is added to the church. He tells us that we need to hear the word. He tells us that we need to believe. He tells us that we need to repent. He tells us we need to confess Jesus before men. And he also tells us that we need to be baptized for the remission of our sins or to have our sins washed away. Baptism. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, it tells us that baptism is a burial. Now, if we have someone of our close relatives that dies and we're going to bury him, we go and dig a big grave. Now, how do we bury him? Do we just pick up a little handful of dirt and just throw it over on the grave and say that that's it? What I'm trying to get to here is sprinkling with water is not biblical baptism or pouring with water is not biblical baptism. We, there has to be a submersion, uh, an absolute burial going underneath the water. And that symbolically is where we're buried with Christ in baptism and we arise a new creature. What about a name? Is the name part of the markings of the New Testament church? If we look at Romans 16, 16, it says the churches of Christ salute you. Uh, now, it, it says it plural there, but it, wherever there's a plural, there's also a singular. There's a church here in Paintsville. There's a church in Jerusalem. There's a church in Corinth. There's a uh, a, a church in Ephesus. And let me ask you all a question. Would you all want my name on the deed to your house? No, you wouldn't. Would you want my name on the title to your car? No, you wouldn't. Would you want your, if you're married, would you want your wife having my last name? Absolutely not. And she wouldn't either. But there are things that are important in a name. A lot of people will say, well, it doesn't matter what you have up over the door. The name doesn't mean that much. Well, it does. The person that died for it, the person that gave his life up for it, the person that shed his blood for it is the owner, and it's the church of Christ. If we go back and, and, and look at through the Old Testament, even up through the New Testament, we see where Abram's name is changed to Abraham. We see where Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Uh, we see where the apostle or Saul's name was changed to Paul. And there were some other people's names that were changed. So with God, names are important. And Jesus uh, was Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. There are things that are important about names. Uh, when I was young, there used to be a thing here in Paintsville called Mr. Cartoon. It came on after school every day. And... At the end of that, the guy that was uh, the moderator of Mr. Carton, he, he would always say, and go to the church of your choice. Let me put a little bit of change to that. And let's all go to the church of God's choice. And let's look for the markings that are in the Bible. Let's use the seed to try to find the church that God wants us to be a part of. Search the scriptures.
be like the Bereans and try to find the markings. What I would like for you all to do is to prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Give me book, chapter, and verse. But if I'm right, look for that church that's in the Bible and become a part of it. Thank you again for being with a shortstop with a shortstop.